Right, so in this video we're going to talk about quantifiers. Now, you may have read maths books or read maths things or had lecturers talk at you, and every sentence they say is full of things like for all something or other, or there exists something or other, or it might say uh, for some something or other, um, what else might there be, for every. And you got all this stuff, and you might just be thinking you're not speaking my language, but actually, there basically are only one of two things, generally speaking, that we're saying when we make a statement like this, even though there can be lots of variations. Um, these are called quantifiers, and there are two uh, symbols. So two symbols, and these are the symbols that uh, look like an A that's upside down, and it looks like an E that's back to front. So you can read this one here as for all, and you can read this one here as there exists. Right, so let's get that pen the same size, eh? Um, so when we got these two things, these let us define the scope of the variables that are going to follow it in the sentence that comes after. Okay, these define just make some space, these define the scope of the variables used in the sentence that comes next. Okay, so they normally go at the start of a math mathematical sentence statement thing, and they say something about what's the dealers with the variables that are inside the sentence that's about to follow. So statements like this one here in analysis are basically shepherd's chips. You're going to come across them everywhere. For every x, here's an example, for every x in a set A there exists a real number epsilon greater than zero such that the absolute value of x is less than epsilon. This is a bog standard statement that you're going to come across in this course. Now we can Write it in symbols, normally we wouldn't, because actually English words are usually easier to, for our brains to understand than symbols. But when, when it comes to actually manipulating things, sometimes getting rid of all of the wordy fluff can actually help to clarify what's going on. So we could write this in symbols as for every x or for all x in a set A, there exists an epsilon greater than zero such that the absolute value of x is less than epsilon. So this here is an equivalent or a sim symbolic version of the same statement. Alright, so notice that in the actual statement part of this, this is the statement, and these are the quantifiers. Our statement has two variables, x and epsilon, and the quantifiers tell us where x and epsilon come from, and also um, what range of x's and epsilons are expected to deal with. Okay, so these variables are called bound variables because they have quantifiers. If you have any variables left over in your statement that don't have a quantifier attached, they are called free variables. So x and epsilon are bound variables as they have quantifiers and if there were another variable doesn't which doesn't have one it is a free variable not to be confused with free variables that you may have come across in linear algebra in the past. Okay, so this statement here applies to every single value of x in a set A. So the way we read it is for every choice of x in a set A, so we can make an arbitrary choice of x, there exists an epsilon, that means there is a corresponding epsilon to our choice. So first step, choose an x, second step, says there exists a corresponding epsilon. So for that particular choice of x, we can find an epsilon such that statement is true. 
Okay, now if we were to prove this, then the epsilon that we choose might be different for a different choice of x. So if I now go and choose another arbitrary x out of my set, the epsilon that exists will correspond to that choice of x, so it may be different from the epsilon that I chose the first time around. So the way to understand this is I choose an x, corresponding to that x, I choose an epsilon, and then I have my statement which, makes, which, which um, I then have to demonstrate somehow. Okay, but we're not focusing exactly on proving things just yet, we're just working with the mechanics of the expressions. So let's just see if we can, if we have an expression like this one here, this is a mathematical statement, like we talked about in our previous video on logic. Um, so we should be able to do things like negate. This is a statement, I should be able to find the negation of this statement um, and find out what that is. So we'll start, we won't start with the most complicated example, we'll start with a simple one. So here's a statement that says there is exists there is an x in my set A, there exists an x in my set A, such that P is true. Okay, um, we could put some meaning to this. So we could say x is a tree, A is the earth. Sometimes it helps if you want to sort of make sense of these things to make up some kind of silliness like this. And P of x means X is green. Okay, here's here's the just the interpretation we'll put on this. So this statement here in words says there exists a tree on earth that is green. So what would the negation of this statement be? Now I bet you if you just stop trying to think in terms of symbols and stuff, you could tell me pretty quickly what the negation of this statement is. Uh, because your common sense is kind of wired to think this way, you've been conditioned over a long period of time to work with stuff like this, this is how we function in daily life. So you could probably say by looking at this, okay, the statement is there exists a tree on earth that is green. The negation of this statement would have to be that there is no green tree on earth, right? The statement is there exists one. The negation would be there is no green tree on earth, or equivalently, all green trees that are on earth are not green. So our negation, I'll write it in that particular way, is all trees on earth are not green. That would be the negation of my statement in terms of words. Hopefully that makes sense. And so we could write this in terms of our quantifiers. It's now a statement, it was a statement about a specific tree. There exists, so specific. Our negation is something about all trees. So it's going to start with, instead of an existence quantifier, a for all quantifier. So for all trees on Earth, they're not green. So not P of X. So when we negate, in fact, let's just move that down slightly. When we negate these things, um, so the negation of our original statement is logically equivalent to, for all x, in A, not P of x. So let's see what happened. The quantifier flipped into one of those, uh, sorry, not A, into one of these, and this got negated. Okay, P of x became not P of x, and the other thing I had to modify was to change my quantifier from a there exists to a for all. So remember we're trying to find some mechanical rules here uh, with which to process these things. Let's test this way of thinking out on the for all quantifier. So if we still stick with our trees are green scenario, this one says for all trees on earth, P of x. So for all x's on earth, for all trees on earth, they're green. All trees are green, this one says. And again, to negate this, to make that, to render that statement not true, all I have to find is a single non-green tree on Earth. There is a non-green tree. So again, let's just see if we can turn uh, do the corresponding thing in terms of our symbols. So our statement about all becomes a 
statement about a specific or there exists a particular one. So a negation, let's see if we write it like this this time. So the negation of for all x in a p of x is logically equivalent to there exists a tree on earth that is not green, not p of x. So again, the quantifier has flipped, so that there exists, uh, sorry, for all, became there exists. And for our statement, again, we just negated it. Okay, so uh, that's nice. So this, it works both ways. For both examples, it worked the same way. We flip the quantifier from exists to negate, uh, to the other one, to for all, or the other way around. And then we negate the statement that goes inside. Same template works for both types of quantifiers. So that should work for something that's a little more tricky. So here's another example. Um, so we'll take an example and we'll use for all x and a. x is odd implies that x is prime. Here's a slightly more complicated expression. It's got a single quantifier still. And our statement inside the quantifier is an implication. So we now know how to deal with this. So if we want to negate this, we want to negate the whole thing. We'll start by just, let's just build it up in steps. So we're going to just write the whole thing all over again. The negation of for all x and a, x is odd implies x is prime. We can just follow the template that we just constructed. So first off, the negation, well, we change the quantifier from a for all into as there exists. And now we have to negate our implication. So we remember how to do this? Well, just a reminder, the negation of P implies Q is P and not Q. So we can just put that in here. So this will become The negation, let's just do it in two steps again. X is odd implies X is prime. So step one was to flip the quantifier, bring the negation inside onto the statement itself. And that in turn is logically equivalent to using our negation rule that we remembered. There exists an X and A such that P and not Q. So X is odd. and x is not prime. Okay, now again, I'd wager that if you just didn't try and do this mechanically, you probably could have come up with that quite comfortably by yourself without actually working through these mechanical steps. Um, because this says that for all x in some set, x is odd means x is prime. If you want to disprove that, which is what we're doing if we're negating something, then all we got to do is find an x, an odd x in our set that's not prime. Again, that makes a lot of sense. And this is kind of the way you've probably been functioning with most of your mathematical proof most of the time. Because generally speaking, we can actually figure out these things like negations quite well without doing it mechanically. But the problem is, when it comes to statements that have maybe three or four quantifiers and a very complicated looking expression inside, that's when this kind of thing becomes a whole lot easier if we deal with it in symbols. If we just flip all of the quantifiers, negate the statement inside, we don't actually have to think about exactly what that means, um, and so we don't have to give our brain a huge workout, we can just uh, follow the steps. Okay, so that's how quantifiers work, so yeah. Last thing I'll say is if we, if we have multiple quantifiers, let's just go back to our first statement we had which was this one here. I'll just grab that and plop it down into space down the bottom. It's gone way in the wrong place. If we've got multiple quantifiers, like in our starting example, now in the right place, we can negate that exactly the same way. Multiple quantifiers, doesn't matter. We can just uh, flip each one separately and then negate the inside. So this will be there exists an x and a such that for all epsilon 
greater than zero. Negate the inside statement, it'll be absolute value of x is greater than or equal to epsilon. Okay, so we flip all quantifiers and then we negate inner statement. So this might be a handy thing just to make a little crib sheet of notes for um, that you can refer back to when you're going to attack proofs and things later on, just to remind yourself how to work with these types of expressions. Alright, we'll catch you later.